Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let's preview what's coming up in this episode. Every day, we take around 20,000 breaths, whether we notice it or not. It affects all parts of the human experience, from our physical to our mental. On today's episode, we explore breathing and its connection to health and movement. The guys discuss breathing dysfunction, sinking your breath, posture, and coaching. We dive into breathing techniques and fixes, breathing screens, and close this episode with thoughts about potential effects on breathing while wearing your mask. So take a deep breath and get ready for today's movement podcast, powered by FMS. So I was coming into work the other day, Gray, and I got a text from one of our employees saying she was going to be a little late. Mm -hmm. Um, With everything going on, you know, Mondays is the day we work from the office. I mean, you probably don't know that because you don't work from the office at all. I call in. Um, Yeah. When you come into the office, it's usually chaos. So try to keep you away from the office. She called in and she said she's going to be a little late because she hit a bear. And I'm just wondering, you think that impacted her breathing at all when she was right before she hit that bear? Well, I'm pretty sure it impacted both their breathing. <laughs> she she probably started breathing in an anxious uh, and very excited way. And uh, unfortunately, I think the bear stopped breathing soon after that. It probably that. took all the breath out of the bear. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we live uh, in the exact same zip code where they started the show Moonshiners on Discovery. So bears and pickup trucks and wide open spaces are not hard to come by around That's here. It's part of the reason that uh, the moonshining is popular around here because the Federal offers don't want to go search for the stills because of the bears. <laughs> we'll just get them when they're on the highway. We're not going to go down there. But believe it or not, a lot of bear sightings have been seen uh, around the area. And I found out something I never knew before up at our cabin. Wait, are you going to admit that? Grade doesn't know something? Yeah, but it took me till 54 years to admit that. So I okay. was pretty good right, right up until then. No, um, I, the, usually, and, and somebody's probably going to, Correct me, but this is what I heard from two different sources. The the first uh, time a female bear has an offspring, there's usually a, a single cub. Many times, if they're in their their second pregnancy, they will have twins. And if they're mature and healthy and in a good environment, they will have triplets. And I've seen two different uh, sow bears, female bears, with triplets at our cabin and gotten probably within 50 yards of them just turning over logs and showing their cubs how to eat grubs. And these cubs are the size of a black lab puppy. It's just most amazing. You get that on video. I did get it on video, but I did it with my iPhone, so it's very hard to to zoom in. But yeah, I'll show it to you after the podcast. It's pretty cool. I was talking to him the whole time. I'm like, hey, Bear. Hey, Bear. What are you doing there? (laughs) I'm sure you were. And sure enough, it's just like a, a, a mother with three kids. You got two kids paying attention, doing what you're supposed to do, and then you got the other kid. That's 100 yards away getting into trouble. So, of course. Yeah. So of course. Bear, bears are very much uh, like humans being that they're an omnivore. They, they, they are in constant search and they can eat pretty much anything. Doesn't mean they always eat the right thing, but it's really, it's really cool to study bear behavior because they're not like any other animal. So, <laughs> so you're, you're saying you're studying bear behavior. Well, I've gone bear hunting a little bit, so it's better to know what you're doing when you do. So, <laughs> well, you know, part of what it, you know I, I mentioned, and part of what I wanted to get into today with you, Gray, is is breathing and how, you know, when she hit the bear, I'm sure that she, you know between anxiety and it took her probably a while for that breathing to calm to get her to calm herself down to a point where her breathing became normal again. And all the stressors and all the things that probably went along with that, something as, as traumatic as pretty much wrecking your car for the most part, how that impacted her probably went on for several hours after that. And, you know, it, it's, it's amazing because when something like that happens, we immediately want to contact somebody, verbally articulate what we have to. So in the situation where you have somebody who's a student of yoga or um, like some of the tactical guys we've gotten to work with, they know how to regulate their state with their breath immediately. So after something traumatic or that whole count to 10 or give it 10 breaths thing, there is a lot of wisdom in saying, okay, let's reset your breath 
before you get into some deep cognitive processing or a conversation. Because what's going to happen is if you start talking or you start thinking, you will probably take that shallow breathing, that anxious breathing that you is easily justified into a place where you'll actually have poor decision making. And, and if you're hypoxic, if you have a low enough uh, oxygen level because you're breathing too fast and not really getting that good gas exchange, it's like trying to make a decision with about six beers in you. That's the problem. You're making bad decisions. And, and a lot of times that little bit of time, those deep cleansing breaths, just slowing everything down, gives you two more perspectives you wouldn't have had at this anxious level. Well, that anxious level, really what happens if you think about it, your whole body tenses up and you get really tense and that's normal. I mean, that's what you, I mean, if you're really anticipating something going on, you want to tense up almost as a protective way of your body just tensing up. So if you got to take a blow, you got to take anything in that instance where she's getting ready to, to hit that thing, tensing up to, to protect herself. Yeah. And, it, and, and too often that dysfunction or in that instance, being functional, being normal too often in normal people, it carries over and that becomes normal. It does. And the, the overbreathing we see is this, this anxious profile of somebody shallow breathing. Imagine somebody angry or, or in distress. But within a few seconds, your entire body pH changes. You go a little bit acidic. And if you stay in that state a little bit longer, you can have a multitude of problems between um, um, insomnia joint pain, um, uh, the, the overbreathing that occurs, like when you do something active, now it sends you into almost what a lot of people describe as like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. And if we look at all these people, we start seeing uh, a multitude of things playing off of each other. So I think more than 60% of people with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also have anxiety or depression. Now, if you get into the debate, what came first, the chicken or the egg, then all I can say is, well, is it easier to change anxiety and depression or find homeostasis with your breathing, find balance with your breathing? So the one thing that I, I do think is important is a lot of fitness professionals, even some clinicians are recognizing breathing now. But the way you fix it is not telling people how to breathe. Just like we learned the way to fix movement isn't telling people how to move. It's meeting them where they're at. And, and I use this term in the movement book, taking you to the edge of ability in a sensory rich environment that works for breathing too. So there's a lot of things we can do to get feedback on our breathing. Like how long can you hold your breath at rest? Because if you can't, that probably means that everything you were doing before that breath hold didn't really even set you up for, for a breath hold. So there's a lot of simple and quick ways to find out, am I breathing at a normal level or is this the first place I should work? Right. I mean, the research is pretty, pretty clear that, you know, one of our colleagues, Dr. Kyle Kiesel has done it, it more than half the population is going to have a breathing dysfunction. And that is, we all agree, the most fundamental thing that we do. And if it's dysfunctional and you don't do it properly and you touched on it, it's not that you just got to take in more air in, it's about getting the air out and that oxygen carbon dioxide exchange, that gas exchange in homeostasis is really what we're trying for. And that's the biggest thing that needs to be focused on if there's a problem, but it may not be just do an exercise or do this. It could be that you're stressed. It could be a lot of different factors leading to that problem. It is. And just, just to give you a quick natural cycle, trees uh, and living plants breathe in CO2, carbon dioxide, and breathe out oxygen. We breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. But believe it or not, from a lot of my study, the CO2 that you're putting out tells us more about how you are than the oxygen you're taking in because it sets off some triggers. And so what we see is exactly what you said. People actually have stagnant air in their lungs and they never fully empty their lungs. And when I was training as a young physical therapist, you know, when we've had somebody like a, a kid with cystic fibrosis or we've had somebody that's been in bed, we have to drain every lobe of lung. And when you have the upper lobes, lower lobes, there's a lot of different positions you got to get in just to get those lungs moving. And it's really easy and convenient to just find this little breathing package and sort of stay right in there. And then anything that bumps 
force you out of that, you start saying, well, that's bad. No, you didn't change the way you breathe in that. And that's what we run into in exercise. There is a different breathing signature that you do in a yoga move than you do in a kettlebell swing or a martial arts punch, but each is directly connected. All right, let's let's dive into that, Greg, because that's a very important point. I think that creates a lot of confusion, especially when we start talking to different professionals about breathing. They immediately gravitate, well, that's not how I breathe when I do 400 pound squats. Well, no, it's not. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. But how often throughout the day are you 400 pounds squatting? Exactly, exactly. And so it's really easy if you're new in exercise or new in healthcare to grab onto the signature that we've got a lot of sedentary people that don't use their diaphragm or low back correctly. And so they upper chest breathe. But it's not as simple as saying, well, you got to belly breathe, you got to diaphragm breathe. Because in a kettlebell swing, you don't want your belly sticking out. You use that abdominal brace, that shield to actually protect your low back. So if we go back four or 5,000 years, yoga and martial arts have both been instructed forms of movement that never once assumed that breath and movement aren't connected. And so the breath done right actually makes the discus throw go better, makes the punch go better, and also allows you to get into positions in yoga you couldn't do if you were holding your breath. So there is a, a place where your natural movement patterns and your breath should line up, both complementing the other. And as things get busy, your breath and your movement address that. So sometimes you're doing a movement and send a signal to your breath to upgrade. And I think that's what Wim Hof's doing. He's getting people to do, do some over-breathing and then do something physically they couldn't do before. But there was also a guy named Phil Maffetone that said, listen, lower everything down. Most people are training at a cardio level that will not let them use their best biomechanics. So if you think of a heart rate monitor and you go down to your lowest um, level of cardiovascular activity, and let's just say, Lee, I put you, I said, I want you to stay between 125 and 135 beats per minute. You can easily get your heart rate higher than that. How far can you go in a half hour? And what you're going to find out is you're going to run and walk because you don't know how to reproduce that steady state at a low level. However, if you were to do that, you could run again tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that, because there's something about that ambitious interval that we all want to do. You ain't ready for it because you're going to make a biomechanical mistake or a breathing error. But if we can get your movement to at least cover some distance and your breath to stay above 125 and below 135, you're going to get humbled, but also immediately efficient. And I think you've said it before. It's about sinking your breath with everything you're doing and trying to create that awareness that if you're just trying to plow through it or, or bust through the wall every time, sometimes it's okay to do that. But if you're trying to do that every time, especially in your exercise, you're going to break down and it breathing sometimes is what can help reset that before you try really anything else. Now you, this is, this is sheer magic. I'm going to bring this all the way back around to the bear. Oh God. See, it's going to be elegant except to you. All right. If you're I can't on, give you any credit. I know. If you're on all fours all your life, you can only take one breath per stride. Whether you're a jackrabbit or a cheetah or a bear, if you're running, usually the way your diaphragm and rib cage go, the fact that you're making a stride pumps the air in and out. So you don't have a choice. But in Born to Run, when Christopher McDougal was talking about how we are all engineered to run uh, in a very efficient way, um, we can choose the way we breathe because our arms aren't connected to the ground. So you can over breathe before you run up that hill. You can slow down and blow off some CO2 if you're feeling fatigued. You can adjust both your pace and your breath independently. And as far as I know, and I'm not a biologist, but I don't think there are many other species that can do that. And it brings me to one other thing. When the ancient cultures always were talking about breath, they never said it, but I saw your breath continues to go on when you quit thinking about it. It is both a subconscious rhythm and a conscious override. How many other things in your body default to subconscious and conscious? So when, when you do things to manipulate your breathing, you actually have one of the best levers to change your subconscious mind, your subconscious state. And what are we talking about here? Sympathetic, parasympathetic, that, that anxiety that we were just talking about. But what, what I think is amazing is how many other things, because Lee, if you got a bad squat, I can tell I you, don't. all right, let's just say you were not as, you know, uh, not uh, as a specimen as, not as much of a specimen as you are. If you had a bad squat or a bad toe touch, two moves that everybody should be able to close their eyes and vision. If 
you can't do it. There's nothing I can tell you to help you, meaning your conscious mind can't overcome that. But if you're breathing too fast, your conscious mind can overcome that. So really the only thing you got control of in movement is your breath. But once you figure that out, there's some assets you can bring to the movement that's your worst thing. So whether if it's a, a stability move, you can't plank very long. There's a good chance the way you're breathing compared to somebody who can plank is different. And if you can't move very well in yoga class, look at the way the other people are breathing, not just the way they're moving, and I think you'll find out the trick. You mentioned body pH and kind of your acidity levels. Mm -hmm. What exactly, what do you mean I, for the person who isn't aware that that's a thing? The tissues and, and fluids in our body both fluctuate from what we would call an alkaline or basic uh, low acidity to high acidity. We see that, that most people who are breathing right and having good diets and also getting good sleep, you know, function around a certain pH, which we don't call acidic. We sort of call that neutral for the, for the human body. Um, and one of the quickest ways to check pH is like with a, with a urine strip, but there's many other ways to do it. Point being the, the shallow breathing isn't just a disadvantage when you're exercising or doing stuff. It actually can turn your body toxic without you even knowing about it. Because there's a whole lot of people who actually eat a very good diet. That's another thing that can take your body more acidic. But, but a lot of healthcare practitioners are actually realizing the science. Most of the disease processes that we have occur at a much more aggressive rate and way more often when we're in a, an acidic state compared to an alkaline or basic state. And that's why you see all these, you know, bottles of water that are a dollar more, but it's an alkaline water. Well, you can, you can adjust your body pH just by, I think, drinking a bunch of baking soda. But is that solving the problem or solving the symptom? Can, most of the things you can do to get your body pH where it needs to be are free. Breathing better, sleeping better, drinking more water, and then Xing out those movements that cause you anxiety and stress for now. It doesn't mean you can't get back to runs or kettlebell swings or out of the saddle hill climbing, but right now it's doing more damage than good. Yeah, I, I had known about nutritional alkaline and, and, and affecting your acidity levels, but I had no idea that breathing could also impact that. So you also mentioned static breath. Um, the like stale breath that's or air that's in your lungs. How, what might be the, like the symptoms that someone would have if that's something that they, they're not breathing at their fullest all the time? Like how would, how might they feel? Like, would they be able to know? You would be, you would be a little bit tired and a little more irritable than you would want to normally be. I think we all know when we're a little bit irritable and, and we usually don't know it till we yell at somebody else or flip somebody off and try and we're like, wow, that, where'd that come from? But I, these are the things that are probably the, if you're trying to be self-aware, uh, everybody knows when you're having a Monday on a Thursday and they, they just do. And they're going to tell you, and some people are aware of it and they apologize of it. But that's, those are some of the first symptoms because if you, I think, what is it? Dr. Andrew Wild talks about the uh, is it four, seven, eight breath? And I hope I don't get this wrong, but it's a, it's an inhale, it's a hold, and then it's a forced exhale. And that back pressure on the forced exhale actually inflates the alveoli, the little bitty lungs within the lungs, the little bitty mm -hmm. air sacs, that little bit of back pressure with a pursed lip breathing. So almost think of in through the nose, hold it a little bit longer than you normally would and then make the exhale take a long time. And he says, you know, do that once, once a day or, or, or a cycle of four, but don't overdo it. Don't turn it into your exercise. Don't bring it in to the gym or anything. Just cleanse that breath every now and then. And if after doing that, you're like, wow, that made a difference, you were probably in the wrong place. If it didn't make a difference, maybe you're getting more toward the right place. But, but please reference that because I think it's, it's probably one of the quickest little self-aware tools you can. And it's almost bringing the remedy first. And that's why Lee and I have talked about, you know, the breathing screen really helped me become a better clinician because when I do something in therapy, I can immediately go back and see this person just held their breath 10 seconds longer and didn't realize it. That means they went into that breath hold with better chemistry because they didn't get the signal to breathe until 10 seconds before the last But time. But most people aren't going to know. Most people aren't going to know. And I think the average person out there is go, don't make assumptions. Just try the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Pull the low-hanging fruit. And if, and if, as Gray just said, you, you've, you're a little bit more irritable, you feel like you're a little bit more tense, just relax. Take in a few extra breaths. 
that's going to help reset the system. Mm -hmm. But again, it's what's the underlying issue. If you're waking up and you're being ir irritable every day, then it could be something else going on that's changing your breath. It's the chicken or the egg. Right. But the low-hanging fruit, try to reset your breath. Right. It is the 478 breathing method. Okay, good. I, um, I checked on that. And then uh, the other day we were uh, doing some filming of kind of some coursework and Lee, you kept going over the breathing exercises before each movement and I'm behind the camera working and I was just doing the breathing work at the same time. And I, I was energized the entire time we were doing it. I mean, we probably did it, what, 15, 20 times. And so I would immediately like always feel better. I, I didn't, I wasn't tired from standing there anymore. I was that much more in tune to what we were doing. And so it was, it was really impressive to have actually felt it on like a personal level while we were going over kind of some of those exercises. I put so. a lot of it, a lot of that in our Indian club program and, and in the, the live coaching session, I'm really coaching up Kyle. It's only two one pound Indian clubs, but if you sink your breath with those ballistic moves, you come out of that and you're like, whoa, and, and it, it's not the Indian clubs and it's not the breath. It's the combination of the breath actually facilitating the move because on an inhale, you stabilize your core and on an exhale, you really relax your posterior chain and anterior chain in a way that you can get into movement. But the, the, I think the, the one thing to learn about that self-awareness is, um, when you come across an asshole, tell them to take a breath and start with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. But I think I think right now with the rage of being corrective exercise, everybody is is doing their correctives to start. But what they do is they get up to their point of where they're where they feel tightness or they feel something, and they just try to hold it and they try to break through it instead of just breathing. Breathing help relax. Breathe through the motion. That's going to release the tension much more than just banging against the wall, which is really what you're doing. I'll give you one more example, and, and it's one of my favorite examples, and we teach it when we teach physical therapists in, in the assessments. When we have somebody bend, just bend over and touch their toes, I've had the question posed to me, so how do, you, how do you look at breathing with movement? And I'm like, I'll give you a quick one that I do. When you go into a toe touch and your fingers are down there touching your toes and you're in a stretch position, and I say, can you cycle a full breath in this position? The people who have to let go of that toe touch and they have to come up about six inches, they take a breath and they go back down. Basically, I make the analogy, so you can't survive in a toe touch. Meaning if I made you hold a toe touch for three minutes, you'd have some brain damage, right? Yeah. Because it, but then I have people who are touching their toes and they go, and they're fine. They don't change their movement at all. So if there are movement positions like rotation, if there are movement positions like touching your toes, that it actually is hard to breathe, you're not going to use those patterns, even though you can get in them because you can't survive there. You're not going to use that as an exercise or athletic move. So a lot of people say, well, I can get to my toes, but you can't live there because you got to change that position to breathe. So your deadlift is actually compromised, even though you don't do a toe touch in the deadlift. Anytime you get about a third into that flexion, you already start negotiating. Should I round my back so I can have a deep breath or should I hold good position and shallow breathe? So the movement screen literally says, you know, if, if you're not breathing the whole time, and I've seen people go into a lunge in a movement screen and they immediately <gasps> and hold their breath to pull off a lunge. You're going to do that in your walking lunges. You're going to do that when you're playing football. So you don't own this pattern. You're renting it because you can't live here. You can't breathe here. So it's, it's a neat little aha moment for a lot of people. I can cover the movement and I can breathe, but you can't do both at the same time, dude. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a, a great analogy. And then, you know, talking about yoga and breathing patterns, you know, I've definitely felt that, you know, some in my yoga practice, my breathing has become so much better. And some of those rotation moves, I stop. And so now I've definitely tried to work on that a little bit more. And I think um, anxiety plays a role in that. I'm a mom, things get stressful, you know, everybody's working from home. And so taking something like that four, seven, eight breathing method and doing it at the desk and feeling better um, immediately and kind of relieving some of those, those tensions and anxieties as well. So. The only thing I would say to that excellent advice is a lot of people will take something that simple and try to pick it apart well before often. We say it here at Movement and I say it there too. Instead of trying to do that every 15 minutes and become a breathing guru, do it when you need it and see if it gives you some self-awareness. So, so I think he's very vigilant saying don't overdo this because it's not a crutch. 
we're hoping to reset something naturally, not practice something that you must always re-upload. So I, I want to articulate the the elegance and simplicity is don't overdo it, but when you do it, do it right or don't do it. We want to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to the Movement Podcast. And to show our appreciation, we'd like to offer you a special promotion. By using the code POD20, you'll receive 20% off our upcoming FMS 1 and 2 virtual course bundle. To be clear, by bundling the FMS 1 and 2 virtual courses, you save $199, but we are giving you an exclusive additional 20% off that total. We are excited about this special event with FMS Foundation. Founder Lee Burton and FMS instructor Eric Degatti on November 6th and 7th. They will be teaching the FMS 1 and 2 live and taking your questions. So to get started on your FMS journey, register at functionalmovement.com slash events and use code POD20 to save that extra 20%. So now back to the episode. So, Greg, we introduced the movement screen going on 20 years ago, and immediately following that, we started talking about correcting those movements and corrective exercise. And soon after that, everybody started being corrective exercise specialists and thinking everybody had to do corrective exercise as part of their programming. And it seems right now, breathing is starting to take that same type of path where, where we're becoming more aware as professionals that breathing, how important breathing is and how many people have breathing dysfunctions. Now everybody has breathing as part of what they're doing. And now they're, you know, putting the microscope on breathing. And that's really not necessary. I mean, it's just part of what should be built into a good workout. Now, you're absolutely right. And, and that's pretty good. I didn't even think about that. But yeah, we, we found a problem. And, and people with a coaching background and a coaching talent immediately try to coach you out of the problem instead of almost making you work through it. And I always have to do this. I go back to it. I mean, whichever version of Karate Kid you watched, we got a kid that's getting tired of, you know, sanding the floor, painting a fence, and waxing a car. But he's he's breathing, he's learning, he's getting fatigued, he's getting more efficient. And by the time he finished all his chores, he was way more efficient at doing it. And then all of a sudden, the kid gets upset, I'm not learning martial arts. And Mr. Miyagi tries to hit the kid, and all of a sudden, the hand's there and blocks it and stuff like that. But he's poised, he's breathing, he knows how to sink those things. Going immediately into the person's problem and verbalizing and articulating it is probably the best way to create anxiety. So what you're saying is, I already know you got a movement problem. And we were recognizing the breathing problems in the early days of the movement screen because in our correctives, we were telling people how to breathe. But it's really neat to go back and just capture the problem and see if you can change their screen or their test without articulating or practicing it. That means that we did something to the subconscious mind. Doesn't mean we can't capitalize it and talk about it later, but the minute you verbalize it, you create a bunch of unnecessary thought that's going to hurt Well, things. what you're talking about, Greg, I think especially for the, for the client coming in off the street to get a workout, they're already coming in aware that they need to be better at whatever they're better at. And as soon as you tell them you've got a problem, this or that, they're going to go home and look it up on the internet and start thinking about it. It's like, you know, if I've got a problem, if I get a headache, well, then everybody starts, a lot of people start searching for what the problem is and you immediately create your own anxiety you do. and that's going to create bigger issues. So then it's a snowball effect. So it's, if, if you know what's going on with a person, you're just trying to give them the best way to help them and breathing should just be part of that. Now, James Nestor just did a, a great book, and I think the, the name of the book is Breath. And even though it was written at a consumer level, I would encourage pros in the movement field, rehabilitation, strength conditioning, personal, personal fitness, wellness, to at least understand how Mr. Nestor is talking to the consumer about breath. He, he talks about uh, our development, how our diet has changed, how our whole facial structure has changed, how we actually have smaller airways than our ancestors, which mechanically is part of the problem. I mean, breathe through a drinking straw for about 10 minutes and you'll see how a lot of people feel. And one of the things that hit me like a ton of bricks as a young physical therapist is somebody asked me one day, we were working on somebody that had a kyphotic spine and anterior head posture, like stand up straight, stand up straight. And then somebody finally showed me on an MRI, all right? Let's look at their airway when they're standing up straight. Let's look at their airway when they're flexed over with horrible posture. If your airway's bigger when you're in a bad position, airway wins. 
And so there's an organization thing that can change, but you don't change it by putting somebody's head back on their shoulders. You actually go all the way down to the pelvis and all the way down to the balance. And Vladimir Yonda, one of the guys I learned from a long, long time ago from the um, uh, Prague School in the Czech Republic, was talking about posture. Now, I was coming out of physical therapy school where everybody was going up against the posture grid, right? And my favorite thing there is, well, I think the right shoulder's a little bit low. I'm like, how do you know the left shoulder isn't high? That's, <laughs> you know, you're always going to be right on the posture grid if you don't know what you're looking for. However, Yonda said something amazingly elegant. He said, if you truly want to evaluate posture, look what somebody does in single leg stance. Because now you truly know how to use your postural stabilizers. And so we have so many tests that look at balance and people think it's a balance test. It's not. It's to see how much of your posture and breath and awareness you're going to give up to try to try to stay on that. And when we watch you and I train people on a balance beam, it's like they're flapping wings. Their arms are all out there. And I'm like, you don't walk on a balance beam flapping your arms. And we say, relax and bend your knees. And then all that unnecessary motion goes away. And, and so the unnecessary breathing cadence, the unnecessary motion, all these lead into inefficiency. And there are a lot of fatigued people out there that have way more work capacity. They're just doing it all wrong. Well, one thing I want you, you touched on that I want you to, to talk about a little bit more is you glossed over it, but I think it's very important right now. I mean, everybody's trying to solve this postural problem people have, you know, from the, the things that people are sticking on their bags to, you know, all these, <clears throat> excuse me, little straps or whatever to get them to stand up straight. Well, you know, if you're sitting at your desk and you breathe better in a poor posture, you're going to be in that posture. So you can get them to do thoracic mobility exercises all day. If you don't attack the underlying issues, you're going to, they're going to be in that poor posture throughout the day. It doesn't matter what exercise you give them. What we learned from a few conversations with NASA was that when astronauts come back from outer space, they have a little bit of osteoporosis. Their bone density has suffered because they've been living without gravity for a while. They were asking us, what do we do? Because if we jump back into exercise, tendonitis, stress fracture, a lot of different things are going to happen. The standing desk was one of the things they did for these guys because they got about two weeks to sort of get their equilibrium back and before they can start working out. And you got to realize most of our astronauts are test pilots. I mean, they're badass people who want to get after it and probably really use their workout to dump stress and optimize the system. So telling those people they got to slow down is, is hard. What they realize, though, is it's not the standing desk. It's frequent postural and positional changes. So standing desk, one foot, standing desk, two foot, standing desk. But we've been doing this at FMS way before you got a standing desk. How do Lee and I do all our phone calls? We're walking around the parking lot, right? So when we got to be tied to the desk, we're tied to the desk. But the minute I know I'm going to be on a phone call more than five minutes, we go mobile. And our parking lot has, you probably log about a mile and a half in our parking lot oh, every yeah. day talking on the phone. I do the same thing. And we just, we go outside, we walk around talking on the phone. Not only am I able to focus on the conversation better, it's the exact opposite of what I was doing five minutes before. So I don't necessarily think standing, sitting is the argument. It's frequent changes in posture. And there's a few other postures like you can go, you can half kneel in a cubicle. And it's really different from the left to right side. So just getting in some of these postures and learning to relax and breathe, it's a two-minute exploration of something different. And that seemed to be, according to NASA, way more robust than just making you stand. It's the variety. Out. I mean, it's, it's the, the variety. variety. And, yes. and you'd see these standing desks. And we have standing desks here at FMS. I mean, I think they're great. But just because we say they're great doesn't mean you need to do it from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. I mean, you have to create some variety. You need to sit some. You need to stand some. You need to walk some. You need to do a little bit of everything, or you're just going to be in that same cycle that, you know, you're going to get good at standing. <laughs> I mean, that's not what you need to be good at all day. So, so we arrive at this place, and, and it's, a, it's something I tell myself every day, so I don't mind sharing it. Don't coach posture. Don't coach breathing. Don't coach movement. Now, what I'm saying is if you're a baseball pitcher, I'm going to coach everything you do. But what I'm saying is getting back to a human, don't overcoach any of these three things. Find out where they work best together. And guess what you and I discovered a bunch of years ago? There's some people that move and breathe so bad and have such bad posture, we put them on their back and say, can you roll to the left and right? And they can't roll to one side. And so we just say, let's play with this. Let's just play here for a few minutes and play with the way you breathe, play with where you roll. All of a sudden they roll. They stand back up and they can balance better. Now, 
you're affecting our business now here when you say don't coach it. What do you mean don't coach it? Because we got to educate people on how to coach it. But what do you mean when you say don't coach it? What I mean is uh, a magician can set up a trick without saying a word. He can walk out on stage and show you an empty hat, and then he can pull a rabbit out of that hat. And so what I'm saying is you're already putting, if you screen somebody and you have done a good job of thorough assessment, you already know where their weakest link is. Don't make them feel bad about it. Put them in a position where they can at least work out at the edge of an ability in a sensory-rich environment. So when I show you you can roll to the left and you can't roll to the right, we got a little conflict there. But I want to keep it light. I'm not telling them how to do it, but I'm going to be there while they're finding it. And I let them tell me, so what did you do? That was good. What did you do? Well, but one thing one thing you said a second ago, let's just let's take the half kneeling. Okay. Right? You put somebody in half kneeling, and immediately you tell somebody to get in half kneeling. What are they going to do? They're going to go down in half kneeling on the knee that they're better at. They're going to get on the side that they're better at every time. The other side's not even an option. Yeah. It's so funny. Right. Right. It's the same way for me. Right? You can always get down on the good knee. But as soon as you tell them to switch, the first thing that happens is their anxiety goes up. Their breathing gets dysfunctional. And so walk us through what you would do there. I basically give them permission to wobble. I give them permission to make a mistake. I tell them it's okay. We've all got a favorite side. And I've actually done this and actually felt bad about it. I had a world-class triathlete in front of me one day, take a knee, took the optimum knee, go to the other side and just balance here. And we were doing just a little perturbation. I'm going to try to push off balance. Within about, I'm thinking a minute, this person, who could do an Ironman was completely smoked. And I looked at him and I said, do you think your cardio just failed you? And he goes, I don't know why I'm so tired. I'm like, because we were in fall prevention mode. You thought you were going to fall. And so you let go of everything. You braced. You actually tried to brace against a fall instead of swaying in the breeze and not falling over. And so what I'm saying is don't pose your posture. Don't. But what were you smoking? Huh? What, what was they? What, what was getting smoked by that person? He was, going, as he was going system. sympathetic. He was yeah. going sympathetic because he was trying to do something consciously that he should have let his. Your subconscious mind is your balance mechanism. The minute you try to balance, you usually do a worse job of balance. Okay. I mean, watch a field sobriety test. There's a hundred percent focus on balance, and they still can't do it. So <laughs> the the the, tr the conventional thinking, you putting someone up against that weakness, up against that half kneel where they can't kneel. Conventional thinking, you walk into a, any gym around the world, the coach is going to be over in the corner, tell them to tighten their glute, get their, get their butt under them, do this, do that. And that's information overload. They're not going to learn that way. I'm going to throw this out at you because it's going to send, this is what sometimes coaching sounds like to me. Hey, Lee, what's two plus two? Uh, Lee, it's four. Okay, what's three plus three? It's six. That's not math, right? I'm posing a problem and a solution. How are you learning? So pose the problem, wait for it, wait for it. But what we've learned with movement screening is we almost arrive right at that scaled thing where if you just follow one simple thing, like, hey, when you roll this time, try to exhale when you do it. That's all I'll say. But play with it. You get to choose everything else. And then I walk away. And I let them have three minutes of struggle. And that's where neuroplasticity and learning happen at a field level. And many people, why do you think you could roll? Everybody will have a different story to tell you, but they're right because these are just words describing the feeling that let them liberate that side. Now, Gray, did you come up with that methodology or is that something that's been around for a while? I think it's been around for a while. It's been around for a while. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, uh, let him bang his finger about four more times. He'll figure it out. And I hate to say it, but most everything we know on this planet isn't from research and isn't from data and isn't from education. It's from trial and error. Not doing it that way anymore. So continuing the conversation about breathing, the current climate we're in, we're all going to be wearing masks probably for a year, potentially. Do you think it's going to affect Maybe the younger person who's wearing a mask, these children, you know, do you think it might affect yes. the breathing? And then <laughs> it'll definitely make some blind dates interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I mean, it's one of those, some people are refusing to wear them because it, it affects their masks or getting medical permission for not wearing them. You know, the average person, what is it going to, what's the, what's the long-term effects? Well, if, 
if your breathing is good um, and you don't have any anxiety about things touching your face, you shouldn't have a problem, even though we could all say breathing's way easier without a mask. But a simple piece of cloth in front of your face shouldn't send you into anxiety. So either you don't like something on your face or that little disturbance and your natural breath is just enough to set you off. So number one, if you're having a hard time breathing with a mask on in public, put one on and walk around the house and just say, what can I do to make this better in case it becomes a law? Because it could, and then all of a sudden, you know, so, so I've always said, if you argue for your weakness, it's the quickest way to own it. So if you notice this little bit of discomfort, what can you do on your side without breaking the rule to make it easier? And there's a couple of masks that might make it easier, but there's some ways you can hold yourself and breathe and think. And, you know, you can always drop the mask somewhere, take a breath and go back up. But I, I think that we're so used to comfort in our society that anything that takes us even 2% out of our comfort zone must be evil and we must kill it. Well, and I think that's the thing, the thing that kind of Gray's getting into that most people need to understand. It's not the mask. The mask is just a symbol of what the, what the issues may be around you. So the mask physically is not doing anything, but mentally it's creating a lot of anxiety. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think people that are really struggling with wearing a mask uh, when they need to, whether it be due to the current situation or maybe in an employment situation is they either really have a little bit of anxiousness about stuff touching their face. And, um, that's, that's okay. I've, I've, I've been there too. I can't stand anybody to put their hands on my face, but more often than not, if it's in a, a sort of a breathing, uh, issue, then number one, make sure you have a, a good mask that does allow airflow. But number two, this might be the first opportunity you get to question. Maybe I do have an airway problem. And here's some things. If you snore, if you have seasonal allergies, if you do get short of breath sometime, if one nostril is almost always clogged, these are things that would indicate that you may have some airway problems. And it's not an emergency, but I get it checked out. There are a lot of different ways you can get it checked out. And, and for those of you who are in movement stuff, we've got a breathing screen on, on FMS that's the sort of culmination of an entire breathing course. Some people don't need to know enough to go into a breathing evaluation, but I want everybody working with movement to see the breathing evaluation the way it should be done. So if you do run across the person that needs a deeper dive, you won't just say, well, go see a, a, a respiratory therapist, because it's not like that. We've got to peel it, and there's three different ways you can have a breathing problem. And, and one of them is really got way more to do with your psychosocial stuff, anxiety and, and, and depression, stuff like that. The, the other is chemical, and the other is mechanical. You don't, the, the, the pipes getting oxygen to your lungs just are getting kinks and bends and stuff like that, or you don't exchange gas well. And it's really, really, um, I think, not good professional practice to advise people how to breathe when you haven't assessed or screened them. I think, I think it's a slippery slope. That'll do it for this episode of the movement podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please take a minute to subscribe, share, and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, remember to first move well, then move often. The trick with a bear is if it's got little ears, it's a big bear. And if it's got big ears, it's a little bear. (laughs) Seriously. Trick with a bear is not be around long enough to look at the ears.